Hello, everybody. Welcome to our talk. Hello, hello. Uh, my name is Don Zikas. I'm a distinguished engineer from Red Hat. I'm here with Gustavo Padovin. He's a kernel lead from Calabra. And we, we are here to talk about uh, the new kernel CI, talk about what that means. Let's see, a uh, little agenda. We're going to talk about a uh, little history about the project, well, who we are, um, who our audience is, and then Gustavo is going to start talking about our new testing architecture, which is kind of the big thing we're rolling out today. Um, benefits of kernel CI, and if we're lucky, we'll have a little demo. Yep. Let's see. Uh, let's talk about let's talk about us. What, who are we, guys? A little brief. Not everyone knows who we are, so a little brief introduction here. Um, a lot of you know we are a Linux Foundation project, the kernel CI. Uh, we've been around for a number of years. Uh, we were started by a number of companies who had a common interest in stabilizing the upstream kernel to make it easier for downstream consumption. So we, uh, we created a mission that said just that, uh, ensuring the quality, stability, and long-term maintenance of the Linux kernel. Our goal was to put together an architecture that pulled in various pieces of the testing puzzle to create a solution or service to the community to help satisfy that mission statement. And as you'll see later, it's a complicated architecture, but we've made good strides towards getting there. And we are excited to share with you what we have. So who's helping us on this journey? As you can see, we have a number of premium members here. We have six, Civil Infrastructure Platform, Calabra, Google, Microsoft, Red Hat, and recently, Texas Instruments. We have a general member, Bay Libra. All these companies have a business interest in helping Linux succeed downstream. They have contributed resources to help our testing effort, and we are excited to have their expertise on our board and help have them help guide us on our journey. So let's see, we've been around for a few years, and uh, well, I guess what's changed this year, what's new? So we kind of switched, uh, recently in this past year, we kind of switched our focus to be a little bit more inclusive of the testing ecosystem, kind of focus some more on getting contributors involved with our project. And this has shifted our goals a little bit, so uh, I just kind of want to reiterate what those are. So as no surprise, we are committed to continue focusing on the kernel quality and stability. That's aligns with our mission statement. However, one of the struggles of defining what stability should be is figuring out what tests need to be run and what platforms. And it isn't necessarily clear across all the maintainers. I know Greg Crow Hartman talks about uh, making sure all the tests are in case self tests or LTP, but let's be <coughs> honest. Not all maintainers are there yet. In some cases, not all maintainers run tests <laughs> or even know what tests to run. So uh, we've got to figure that out. And you know, hardware is important. Uh, how do we know what hardware needs are and if a particular hardware has been tested or not? Not all maintainers have all the uh, variety of hardware out in the ecosystem. Therefore, another goal is to work with the community to identify their testing and hardware integration needs and consolidate that into a place where that information can be easily parsed by humans or CI systems. Ideally, this turns into a self-service workflow where maintainers can quickly push their changes and have a community of human testers and CI systems run a report of matrix results that make it clear where the test gaps are and what hardware integration feedback they need to declare stability. Testing and hardware integration is just part of the equation. You know, aggregating the data to be processed, tracking the regressions, managing the CI systems, all the labs that contain the hardware, the reporting, and presenting everything in a way such that the community can get involved requires lots of coordination. Therefore, we see ourselves more as an umbrella project with various working groups helping to define the standards around testing. By encouraging some basic standards, it creates a clearer path for how community members can, get, can participate and even automate large chunks of our testing needs. So we also have a lot of infrastructure needs that need, need to be managed because we do run a service. And as described above, there's a lot of various, there's various pieces to the puzzle underneath this umbrella. We believe that having a basic set of testing services that coordinates with the community is not something that can be achieved as standalone tools. And as a Linux Foundation entity, we find ourselves in a position to work with other companies to coordinate donated resources that we can then turn around and provide back to the community. Finally, as a Linux Foundation entity, we also have a stream of funding that we can use to help pay for new te technical implementations or continue developers work on um, pieces of the puzzle that help the community. This allows us to help maintain core infrastructure and uh, accelerate features we need for the testing ecosystem. 
and we've been in, uh, we've been working with various developers on uh, providing them funding for uh, get a lot of their, their hobby, hobby projects that they do on the side to help the community. Uh, let's see. How are we going to achieve these goals? So a lot of you may have heard the term shift left. The popular term these days is about moving everything to the, the left side of the developer pipeline. I hope that you, you test early, test often, and then the right side when you go to merge it is stable software. But uh, beginning, so we want to begin with the maintainers. We want to work with them to decide how code should be tested and on what hardware. Then we turn around and work with various CI services and, and the labs to accommodate these requirements. We ensure that everything passes or that the failures are either tracked as flakes or reverted as failures or actually fixed. This will help provide a higher degree of confidence in the code before it gets pushed up to Linus. The early focus should allow us to expose regression sooner and resolve them upstream with the patch author. This leads to faster downstream stabilization and product integration because most of the bugs would have been flushed out early, allowing downstream integrators then to focus on pushing their updates faster and resolving more complicated customer workload issues. Of course, this means we need to be strong advocates for pushing the shift left approach across the ecosystem and you'll be hearing us bang that drum later this year. So who do we have to convince of this? We've, uh, we've identified four key audience members that we're gonna be focusing on as part of this effort. Um, the most important one is obviously the kernel maintainer. Our entire workflow revolves around helping them ensure their stability, their, their subsystem is of high quality and stable. As you will see, we're trying to create value for the maintainer by utilizing our services and accessing the results so they can decide if the code is ready to be merged or not. We'll be creating a number of ways a maintainer can interact with us to provide them flexibility on how they do their work. Another audience member is the upstream developers, those that contribute code changes or test changes. Our focus is to make it easy for them to figure out if their changes have been tested and how it's been tested and on what hardware. And if the changes caused any failure, what they can do to help narrow them down the problem quickly and reproduce it and test any fixes. We also expect to make it clear that any test contributors know how they can get, get engaged, improve the test quality, and, and help out the developers when fixes need to be addressed. And finally, our, our hardware vendors is another targeted uh, audience member. They have hardware that we like to see tested and provide coverage. So the process should be streamlined to onboard their labs and connect the various CI systems to get their results on our dashboard. Currently, the testing ecosystem is kind of, it's limited to what the maintainers can test on easily accessible hardware. We want to we wanna expand that. So you know, adding an enterprise hardware and some hard to get embedded systems uh, would add value to the ecosystem. And then we've got product makers, the downstream integrators that take Linux stable, productize it, and sell it to customers. How do we make it easy for them to plug into the ecosystem and not only get their test feedback, but incorporate their testing needs into our testing pipeline? That way we can help them speed up their integration and stabilization. So we wanna work on a process to capture that feedback and provide them a test result picture to let them see where the quality of Linux stable stands before they integrate with it. But while it sounds easy on paper, Getting developers to change how they think about this problem is going to take, is going to be challenging. We need a cultural shift. <laughs> we expect some enormous effort working with companies and communities to open up their testing efforts and contributing to the larger Linux testing effort. We expect to spend enormous effort working with the companies to provide access to their hardware for open source testing and convince them to trust various CI systems to interact with that hardware. We expect to spend enormous efforts to convince the community and, and kernel maintainers that, uh, that CI systems are, are something you can trust and that the tests and its qualities are, are, are worth looking at. But to achieve all this, we're gonna have to start with a foundation that can absorb all our goals and our expectations. I will now hand this over to Gustavo to talk about the architecture changes we have been making over the past year and to create this foundation. Gustavo. All right. Thank you, Don. Okay, folks, let's, uh, let's move on. Uh, we'll be talking a little bit about the testing architecture of kernel CI. So yeah, that's uh, our drawing. Before I dive into that, um, I think there's like, a, as Don was saying, there is like a big effort on building an ecosystem behind this, like on bringing uh, a lot of people in this community who are interested into pushing forward like more testing, more process, more, more, more uh, CIs and so on 
And with those people together, we can come up with all sorts of uh, standards and specs, uh, schemas for our database in, in case I'd be, and we can create something that will work for everyone. So we've been for the past many months like uh, talking to a lot of people in the, in the community and figuring out how we build these things forward. So this thing that you're seeing here is the, is the result of like a, a lot of discussions and now so a lot of work from the current CI team like developing that. Of course, there is a cultural shift that needs to happen, but there is still a lot of technical work we need to do. There is a lot of engineering we need to throw in this. There's a lot of investments that we need to put uh, on this. Uh, this is the beginning of like maybe a 10 years ride to get to a place where we can see a different flow into the into Linux kernel and a different flow into getting things from the day you send a patch, the maintainer and people review it, um, that will land in a tree, then that lands into mainline, and then from there it goes to a product bench or to a stable. That's a long process, and the more we short on that, uh, and shifting left, as Don was saying, is, is one way of, of doing that. And there is obviously many other discussions in the community about regression tracking, about like our workflow issues and so on that uh, will somehow connect into all this. So if we start like diving to this, uh, can I use the mouse here and can I see? Yes. Um, it's essentially like a flow, right? You get uh, your pets in here, things get tested, and his zoots will come on the other side. That's like the overview. Uh, now I'm going to start like diving in into different pieces of this. So starting with like the input side, if you wish, we have like the, sub the test submission phase where we can get like um, git trees. That's something that uh, our core system support already, like we have a bunch of different maintainers three in there. We are testing, building those, testing those. Um, it's uh, watching like every two, three hours that we are picking uh, the brands and, and doing those tests. But we've, all, we've also put together a system that is able to, to an API, receive like a bunch of uh, test requests from other systems. Uh, if you were yesterday in the graph room, uh, you saw the GitLab CI discussion where we were trying to from GitLab CI insert like test requests into, into the Maestro system and subsequently into the kernel CI ecosystem. Uh, the same is true for patchwork. We, we have a halfway uh, a finished implementation. We are, we are getting there. And then other tools could come into place like before and, uh, and so on to enable people to easier and easier to get like pets into, into a CI ecosystem. Um, we also work on some tooling uh, called KCI Dev, where you can go and try some jobs. You can do by sections uh, in certain devices. Uh, there is other things that we are putting together. KCI Dev is a very recent develop development, has like maybe a month or something old right now, but it's a project that we are uh, investing for becoming like a potent tooling for focusing on the kernel maintainer, on, on, on commands that the kernel maintainers will need from, from CI systems. Um, and yeah, the, the call for action here uh, is you can just come and add your tree. Like uh, it's hard to, that link is pretty big, so I couldn't like just put in here. But if you go there to the website and download the, the, the slides, you can, uh, you can see it. Or you can talk to us in the hallway track as well. And then the next, the next stage is um, Maestro, which is like a core orchestrator, also sort of message buzz where we can land a bunch of test events that are coming from, from the different systems, and Maestro itself has the list of trees that it's tracking. It has uh, specs for which tests you should be testing against which trees. Uh, it's also generating like, a lot of the root, of, root file systems that we are using kernel CI. So it's storing a lot of like, artifacts and information that uh, we want to use in the testing. And um, the direction we are going here is to start creating like, standards on how we should be specifying how things, how things should be tested in, 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 in the kernel, not just for this system, but for everyone who'd like to get like more um, coordinated information from, from kernel CI and, and start like testing things. So Maestro is, is placed like in a, if, you, if we go back into, into the main drawing, you see that Maestro is, is placed like to receive all the test requests or, or generate a bunch of it itself and and then it can forward results into our our common database uh, and also 
there is a CI ecosystem that could benefit from the test events. It's not like something that CI systems have to do. We are not enforcing anything in here. Uh, they could they could just do their own test like uh, CKI and Sysbot are doing are doing today and or zero day uh, and so on and and those CI systems can now send their tests into into KCIDB. Um, let me move into the labs side of things, labs and CI um, system side of things. So on kernel CI we have like our own uh, federation of labs. The project itself doesn't have any lab, but we have a few companies and entities that we, that are hosting labs. Uh, some of the consultants around, some of their companies in kernel CI they are uh, hosting labs. And those would be like the kernel CI labs, which is also part of like the Maestro infrastructure. But from our architecture point of view, we we place it together with all the other CI um, CI systems. And and there you can have like a different uh, lab technology. Like uh, we have a, a few Lava labs. Uh, we are looking to AWS uh, labs as well as we speak. There is a POC uh, going on with the team, uh, and more labs. I'm sure more labs will be coming here. Uh, sometimes, because of IT policies, you can't really uh, work directly with uh, with uh, the kernel CI system. So you may be you may need to take your CI system like behind a furrow. So that's something that we, we've been um, preparing for as well, and some, some companies are in the process of enabling their, their CI system behind the furrow. So labs can connect like in, in different ways, either to reflect like the standards APIs for runtimes into uh, the labs infrastructure in kernel CI, or you, you can just listen to the events and, and, and get, your test, get, get the test events, understand which things you should be testing, and execute the tests. And um, the next thing would be that you send all those results into our common database. Before I go there, if you have a hard lab or if you have a CI system, we are interested in getting your lab in or your CI system in, uh, talk to us or send us an email or meet us in the hallway. So the next step here is our common database. If I go back here so we can remember everything. Submission happens here, or interactions from a maintainer community level will happen here. Maestro coordinates like a bunch of the uh, generation of test events. There is a CI ecosystem that can support uh, listening to Maestro independently uh, test things, and how that lands into KCIDB. That's a lot of data, right? And moving forward again, what's happening here? Okay. So that's case IDB. Uh, it's a project that uh, we have for a, for a few years. Nikolai here is the case IDB maintainer. Uh, he has been putting together uh, um, a set of like database schemas that that uh, behave as a spec standard for how to submit test results data into our common database. So if you want to to do uh, the submission of your data, you can just go to the schema, understand how, how it works, and uh, get your API key and send the data in. Um, and the goal is, of course, like having this central database, we can do a bunch of a bunch of things with that. We can compare data from different CI systems. We can have common strategies to analyze the data. Because when you start looking to the amount of data we are producing every day, it's overwhelming. Like it's uh, it's pretty much impossible for maintainers to just like look into the raw data and, and, and try to, to make sense out of it. That's like one of the big pains that we have in the community. Like uh, we, can, we can do as many tests as we want, but uh, if we're unable to look into the test results, that's, that, that's not going to take us anywhere. So one of the things we've been um, spending a lot of time lately in, in case IDB is improving the post-processing capability of it, like adding like more intelligence into case IDB so we can uh, instead of like just throwing you some test failures, we can instead like uh, give you like some higher context uh, piece of information that will say, well, this kernel uh, has a test failure here, but uh, actually we are seeing the same failure across like different kernel configs and different devices or even different CI systems. And that's a much higher density piece of information that I, I can go and tag into Hexbot, for example. We've been, we've been trying to find ways that we can programmatically connect into, into Hexbot. Uh, still early days, but uh, we are getting there. And 
and that process, uh, which I think I should be already in the next slide to talk about that, is a is a over time uh, through feedback from the community developing this powerful aggregation uh, system that where you can get like all your all your regressions um, in a way that um, I know it, it is reducing a lot of like the the work that uh, developers and maintainers have to do, and um, by by going in like a, we are filtering, we are exposing regressions. There are like a capabilities for uh, email notifications that are, are highly uh, configurable. Like you can go and write like your own, your own scripts to get your, your data out. Uh, we are investing right now on doing a lot of that automatically. So by parsing the log, we can compare if that same sort of signature is somewhere else. And, and then we can start like, combining that. Uh, either that might be a regression, or it could be like flakiness, and we, we can also identify that. Yeah. Uh, just a quick question. Uh, aside from functional testing, is there, is there also a way to report uh, performance regressions? Uh, we are not there yet, but we are working on it. Uh, there is. Actually, there is a schema support for that. Okay. So you can do that. Yeah, he said there is a schema support database for that. Uh, we can do that already. And there is, I'll be talking about the dashboard, there is a... Is there a talk on Friday about that? There is, a, yeah, there is more discussions. Like, we are trying to, this is just the case, the current CI point of view. But uh, Timbird, for example, he's looking to KTAP performance uh, markers. And we're developing some boot time performance tests as a, one of the uh, experiments into that. And case ADB can do the performance. So we're trying to solve the whole ecosystem, right? That's, that's, the, that's the vision. Yep. Can it? Uh, actually, I have two questions for now. Uh, one of them is how this project integrates with tools that maintainers are already using. And second is how can we actually, from a maintainer point of view, use this system to test Keras? Because, like, uh, for, for, regarding the first question, at least from the file system maintainers, most of them use KDevOps to to do some testing, mm -hmm. which is a great tool. It has some missing functionalities that Louis probably I don't know if it's here. Oh, there it is. He's right there. Yeah, I and can't. He's behind. He's, <laughs> we were talking, and he's working towards that and but now how to do integrate with with that and regarding of the other the second question <coughs> is i have been trying to automate tests for file system for at least for a an year and every time i try to do that it's almost impossible to integrate this with any other ci things because usually we need to rewrite everything we already do to <coughs> integrate this. i know yeah that yeah, so, so that's why we have case IDB. Like, uh, I, my understanding that uh, the file system community is creating a sort of file system next tree to merge all the paths together and, and test that. That's what uh, I heard. Like, uh, uh, anyways, uh, what, what, um, what we can do is that we can just like, develop like, the translator for whatever test uh, results you have into case IDB schema and have that into case IDB. So we don't need to necessarily rewrite our stuff. That's that's the, the power of like the infrastructure we're trying to put together. Like we don't want to enforce anything into people. We want to, we want to have like a, a way where we can have what we have today, and then we can benefit from from this somehow. And then with time, maybe we can evolve it. Maybe we can rewrite it. Maybe we can go and and uh, do this in a way that will fit better what my answer is doing. But it's not necessary. I think we can solve some problems for file system with this thing that we have today. Can humans Microphone. run your tests Mike. today? Sorry? Can, can a human run your test today, or do you need well, DevOps to do well, it? Well, a lot of things I need to do manually because we don't actually have a good CI infrastructure behind it to actually do most of things autom automatic. If you can describe how you do it manually, we have CI systems that might be able to, or we have, we have a team of people that might be able to work with you to figure out collaborate on maybe? Mostly what we are doing here, at least on XFS, we basically run KDevOps on two different trees, one to, on the current Fortex tree to create a kind of baseline for the testing, and then we actually run KDevOps on the patches we are integrating to 
should look specifically for regression, which is usually FS tests plus LTP tests. So. Right. Yeah. Uh, so we could talk offline more about this. Yeah. So I, I feel that KDevOps is a system here, yeah. in this in this part, like in the CI ecosystem. Like uh, it, it, it's a tooling that uh, you are using to execute the tests, and it could be as well be uh, integrated to send the data into KCIDB. That 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 would I would see as a first step. We can chat more about it. Yep. So you mentioned that you are detecting similar results from case, uh, KCIDB to give a history of if the issue has been seen for some time. So I'd be interested what kind of mechanism you're currently using. Uh, Hegler expressions. <laughs> <laughs> Just like simple matching. Not your, your AI stuff is not here yet. Yeah. OK. But it should. Any more questions before we move on? Nope. We were here. OK, so I guess it's uh, demo time. I'll just put this. Into the screen, can people see this? It's loading, yes. This wasn't a secret, but um, here is the new kernel Web dashboard. We spent like the past uh, many months like uh, investing on this. Uh, we did some UX research, some maintainers were interviewed by the UX team uh, that, that has been hired by the kernel CI Linux Financial Project. And we got to this point where we have a MVP that we can show uh, to everyone. So this is collecting data from, from case IDB, from uh, different origins. You can go and, and look into the data from, from Head Hat, from Microsoft, uh, from, from Sysbot. It's all there. And from Maestro, it's uh, the system inside kernel CI. And then you can dive in. Like, uh, that's the Android tree. Um, you can see like the build status, uh, how many are passing, how many are failing. You can see some trends. Uh, then we can go and dive in into, into some of the data. The same is true for, for boots. Uh, you see your trends, you see your test results. And then we can uh, filter by failures. So there is one boot failure here. Let's see what's going on. Um, there is a kernel log. I guess we can read it, see what's going on. OK, here's a failure. See, we, we are able to extract like a, a piece of, uh, of the log and, and throw it here. There is still a bunch of uh, things we didn't implement yet. There are, there are bugs. Uh, this is into dashboard.kernelci.org. Uh, it's live. You can just go there right now and, and use it. Now I need to go back into my presentation. And uh, it's ongoing development. We, we are uh, investing seriously on this, uh, on the kernel CI uh, Linux Foundation project. Um, it's going to be evolving over time. Like some people are giving feedback to us like uh, all the time. Like I just got some feedback from Todd this week to improve like the, the dashboard. And the other maintainers are starting to look into that. And uh, we'll be driving not only the dashboard, but um, the whole architecture based on how we learn more from, from the community. That's, that's, our, that's our, uh, our North. That's our North Star. All right. The demo was successful. So let's move on. We have 15 minutes. So in a nutshell, um, we want to contribute to like, this, this ecosystem development where we can have like, standards, we can have like, specs. Uh, we can also put together this uh, complex uh, setup where there is like a few systems working to take the complex out of the community to take like a and, and make like that into a service and I think one word that they yeah, trust like we we need to get to a point where this is fully trusted like oh I'm using kernel CI to help me on my pull requests on, on me merging pads and and so on that's that's where we're going and uh, we know that uh, we're, this, there is not going to be like one kernel CI solution that's going to fit everything. 
Uh, it's a, it's an ongoing discussion with, uh, with the community, with implementing this, with more people coming in, uh, with more investments into this. I'm, I'm pretty sure that we are like one tenth of our size right now, like in terms of like the amount of investment that we need in, 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 in CI or even is smaller than that. Like it's a, it's a huge problem we have to solve. And um, yeah, there's a lot of duplication around. We, 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 we are starting as an example with the hardware vendors working group. We had the first meeting yesterday and uh, every hardware vendor was doing the same thing internally. Like, uh, and you see the same dashboards like in different colors uh, all over the place. Like, uh, why are you doing this? And okay, just to reiterate, how can you benefit from this? Many ways. We can get your trees in, uh, your tests. Uh, tests we have to go and generate like who to fast for that. Um, but that's just like a, a piece, extra piece of work. We can get a date in case ID, and then we can post process that. Uh, you can go to the dashboard. We have the, the, the web dashboard that you just saw. We also have a Grafana version where people can go and. Uh, have trends, they can go and look into their own ways uh, uh, of analyzing the data, their own queries and so on. So that's like an extra uh, uh, support that they're provided to, to, to maintainers. Then there are email notifications, uh, and of course we definitely want your feedback on this. Uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's something that we, that we want to keep growing, keep like evolving the way that uh, we are supporting the maintainers and, and, and all, the whole audience, like, of course, like the hardware vendors, product makers, uh, everyone that's interested in making the kernel, kernel better in the, in the coming years. Um, and we're also investing actively on engaging uh, with the maintainers and community in general, getting feedback from you, uh, understand your requirements, understand what's missing. For some people, only a few things are missing. For others, we know that we are still a bit far in terms of like how the ecosystem can, can support you. But uh, each little problem we solve, we get closer to, to solve more problems. Like so if we, if, we, if we take like the full flow for one um, SOC maintainer, for example, we, we are solving pretty much for our SOC maintainers. And, and that's where, we are looking at to, to drive out this work. Like we can customize the dashboard, like we've been throwing requests into the web dashboard development team um, from, 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 from customer uh, client feedback on, on kernel CI. And, um, and they are just like prioritizing that and, and implement that like as soon as possible. Uh, then which test do you need? We do of course a bunch of case self test and uh, NLP, that's like the, the, the uh, most common ones, but more test suites can, can, can be part of, of, of kernel CI. Um, yeah, that was your requirements. And one more thing that uh, we are investing a lot and it's also related to uh, the overwhelming um, situation of the data that we have is the quality of the tests. Some areas are pretty good. We are, we are driving things well. We have good tests. Other like, like are falling behind. Like uh, one, one area we started investing first was like the device testing where all the time like a flakiness was happening or the, the, the parameters for that hardware in the kernel was, was changing and the test starts to fail, but uh, why? And then someone has to go and look manually into what's going on in there. Uh, so we've been developing better tests. That there is a, uh, we've been calling it testing quality. It's a working group in kernel CI. We're focusing on uh, improving the quality overall, like the speed, the coverage, uh, portability. We are also advocating for those tests to live in mainline, so the maintainer will also be acting that and be following that. Um, and it, there is a common way for for people to to follow the regression. Like uh, this is failing. Here's the crash. But how do you get there? You know, you know the test. You know how to build it. It's, it's in three. So that's something that uh, I think it's part of the cultural shift that we that we've been uh, that we're that we're talking about. There are bi-weekly bi meetings. Uh, if you wanted to join, uh, talk to us. Laura, back in the there is the lead of uh, of that working group. You, you can talk to her as well. Um, and that's it. Oh yeah, it's coming. Oh, I have. Hi, thank you for the talk. Yeah, there's more slides, yeah, just, but, ah, yeah. A couple more. <laughs> yeah, three more, yeah. Okay. Um, that's our ambassador, <laughs> Greg. Yeah, he has been always like a very um, talkative about kernel CI and uh, selling us to, to people. Um, and um, more things at the Linux Plumber Conference. I know there will be 
a bunch of questions and we want to actively engage with people. So we'll be in the hallway uh, from three to six. Uh, we we'll have like a banner with kind of side logo there. You can just stop by and, and, and talk to us. We will we'll be uh, happy to, to chat about it. Later in the evening at 7 p.m., Kernel CI uh, will be hosting a happy hour at 7 p.m. at the View Cafe Bar. It's just across the river. Uh, hopefully, the water didn't get to it. Um, and then tomorrow, we have a few uh, sessions in the Test Micro Conference. We are talking about uh, common device testing. Uh, there will be like a, a deep dive into interactive with the current test results, kind of like a, some, some of the things that I, I, I shared here, but uh, going to discussions, going to getting feedback from people. Uh, later in the afternoon, we are talking about boot time testing and 5 p.m. for the survivors. Um, we have a buff on kernel testing. And yeah, that's it, get involved. Uh, we need a better future for integrating this kernel everywhere. It's getting more and more critical. Uh, we have a mail list, we have a RSC channel, uh, we have committee meetings uh, every week. And uh, yeah, talk to us. And that's it, thank you. No, thank you for the talk. <laughs> so, um, as far as I understand, lots of things in kernel CI are opt-in. Like, maintainers need to opt-in their trees, developers need to yeah. ask for tests and ask for results, look at the results. While in lots of modern processes, the CI is integral part, it's not the opt-in. Like, you don't need to ask for tests and you don't need to ask for results, you don't need to look at the results. Uh, so the question is, how well this opt-in model is currently working for kernel CI? Like how many, what, what percent of maintainers opted in? What percent of patches been tested? What percent of test failures have been looked at and addressed? Mm -hmm. And so do you have any insights on this? Uh, I mean, you probably know more, it's yeah. low right now. Yeah, so, so this is what, what we have been doing, like uh, we've been, like this is the new kernel CI. Like uh, it's almost like we are doing a reset on what we were doing before, uh, compared to our legacy system, for example. I think the main issue is overwhelming the maintainers on on the data because we can we can automatically go to kernel.org and listen to all the trees and and build all that and send reports uh, and execute our okay, self test on that. But uh, we won't look into it, or maybe a few maintainers will look into that. Um, so how did we build things so far? We spent a lot of time doing manual work to figure out the process. It's like, oh, we're already building those trees in kernel CI, but let's enable like those three tests only. Like we, we, we develop like a new test for probing all the devices listed in the device tree and all the things that uh, are in the ACPI uh, table. And so the same things for USB and a few other tests. And then we were manually looking to the regressions that were coming out of that and going to the maintainer report in that, tagging to Hexbot and so on. And then we understood like a little bit of a process. So we have a bunch of trees from maintainers, but we are not willing to just throw you a report out of the blue. So that's why we want to slowly grow this. Like we are open for anyone who wants to, to work with us. But uh, I don't think it's gonna be healthy for, for the ecosystem if kernel CI just like uh, bombard people with reports. But the data is there. We just need the, 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 the maintainers come and, and, and talk to us. Thank you. Uh, maybe I missed it or will kernel CI is, is on the roadmap to tell us how much of the kernel we're hitting uh, from a coverage standpoint? Um, and where we need to put our put our attention where it's not being focused on? We would love to do that. I don't think we have any. It's on the roadmap. It's on the roadmap. But the we have a thing called test catalog. We haven't really hmm. talked about it much, but the idea was what does coverage mean? What does coverage mean to a subsystem maintainer? And you got to go through all the subsystem maintainer, define that, and then collectively overall get that coverage, right? Um, and right now we're struggling to figure out uh, what tests mean something to subsystem maintainers. We're trying to 
put that together right now because right now you look at a lot of subsystems like we can't figure out what test to run and you know Red Hat's got its own test, Collaborate's got its own test. We're trying to put together a, a collaborative, a, a community version of the test suites so we can start approaching that metric. So, and, and kind of two blank spots. One would be coverage. The other one would be, you know, more the safety oriented focus is adherence to design, right? Open source is just hurting cats. There's no design. So, so here's my answer to that is, yeah. <laughs> so by the test test catalog, by getting a community together around tests about what tests we want to run, now you can say, okay, the community has organized these tests per subsystem, and t we work with Texas Instrument, they're like, okay, now we can start putting functional test requirements right. into there as part of the functional spec, and maybe we can start driving that from that angle, but we need to start with a community, an agreed upon community set of tests before we can start injecting that yeah. as a thought. Now process. we have two quantifiable things, right? Are we covering the code, and does the code meet the goal? Yes. So yep. that's long term, but definitely. Hopefully next year at LPC we'll have a, a, that story. Yeah, like, we, we definitely need the community to get together, and, and that's what, like, we're doing the test a lot of discussion in the morning, like a few people were, were coming together first, like uh, ourselves, we, we are unable to, to do that, like because we're, for right now we're a small team. But if the community is coming together, it's like, look, how do we integrate test coverage on this? We work, we work together. Look to the safety groups. That's what yeah, we're yeah, 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 yeah. We got Texas. Are you friend Lisa? Texas yeah. Instrument. Okay, yeah. <laughs> yeah. We have a chat this afternoon already yeah, scheduled. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um. So there, there was this talk yesterday about uh, GitLab CI coming in and they were mentioning that we are both working together, uh, getting all of this together. The, the thing I'm a little bit worried is that uh, kernel CI is post-merge, as far as I understand. I mean, like maintainers are, I mean, yeah. Uh, but adding tests to kernel CI requires you to submit merge requests, add the tests and everything, while on the other hand, you also have to deal with the CI pipeline if you want to have the GitLab one uh, first. So um, do we have any plans to, like, if we enable the GitLab one, then you automatically get kernel CI? Exactly, exactly, yeah. That's that's what we discussed yesterday in the graphics room. That uh, GitLab CI, our goal is to have, like, code into the mainline kernel that would uh, kind of a GitLab CI lib in there that can call into kernel CI APIs. Okay. And then we can set up, like, your GitLab server anywhere, like on GitLab.com or for desktop, and that would uh, call into kernel CI. That's our, that's our plan. Okay, thanks. Or actually, uh, a, a lot of trees today, they just, they create four kernel CI dash next branches, and we just, we just trigger off some of those too as an easy, yeah. easy way to. Yeah, that's a pre-merge testing. Yeah. What is the migration plan for present users? Do we have to re-opt in, or is that? We mi migrate all the trees that are active. Uh, we didn't brought all the tests, but uh, if something's missing for you, you, you should tell us. Uh, we didn't put together notifications, uh, test results reports for everyone. That's something that we are doing like on a one-by-one on one basis right now because of the reasons I, I said before. Okay. Maybe we enable input like in a main list that people can, can go and look into everything, but uh, we are refining the reporting system uh, at, at the moment. And some maintainers are working first with that, on that. Thanks. So uh, one thing I wanted to ask is about like a bit the, the limited resources. So basically, for example, the board labs. I just would like to understand a bit, um, like let's say a new user comes in and would like to have tests on real hardware running. And uh, obviously, if you have too many coming in, then the real hardware is mm -hmm. a bit overused. And so do you have like any plan for like, I don't know, like policies or something for how new users should come into the project and like what's expected of you as a new user to support the current infrastructure that is there. And like also I think about like, like if you for example have currently boards in a lab there and you want to extend with new tests for your specific hardware needs, um, like how, how, how could that be done? Like do you have policies in mind for that? We don't have any policy yet, um, but I think the problem you're stating is a pretty, pretty good one to have. I think we, we want to be there where we need to start like limiting the resource somehow uh, because there is too many users. Like uh, either that's going to happen or people keep investing in the labs and adding cloud resources to, to us. Um, it's not something that we really thought about. I think we had some discussions. Like for example, for pre-merge testing, do you allow anyone to throw up a patch in there? 
I don't think so. People just like, uh, I know, hack our system or mine Bitcoin to it. Uh, so there should be some ACL uh, type of thing. And um, for accessing the lab, we also need to, 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 to figure out that. Like, because like the Collabor Lab, for example, we share that with MesaCI. And MesaCI is a pre-merged infrastructure with one, one hour, uh, oh, sorry, one hour like a uh, turnaround. If we throw too many tests in, we, we just break them. Mm -hmm. So we, need to, we, need, we, have, we have to get there. Right now, we don't, we don't suffer from that. But uh, if we get there, we have, it's a great problem to have. So, I mean, again, one of the things we're trying to do is we're trying to be a standards body and trying to come up with various standards. And, you know, CI systems kind of are going to dictate that policy because some CI systems have more flexibility to run on more hardware. Other ones are going to, well, other, other CI systems are going to say it's kind of a cost thing, so they're going to minimize it and, and kind of restrict it. So we're, we're hoping to define, work with everybody to kind of define some, some standard policies in the, in the coming year. Um, I know there's a bunch of labs are trying to ramp up that are asking those questions. Yeah, so. yeah. I think there's, there is... Like you have to look into the priority of each test, um, how often we can do tests. Like if you, have, if you have enough resources, you could do every patch. Yeah. But uh, we do every three hours in currency. Yeah. Right now. Yeah. I think that's good time. Okay. So, uh, maybe another round of seven. Okay. Sorry. Has anyone from <laughs> Zephyr been in touch with you? No. 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 Yeah. We, yeah. We can. We can. We can chat. Yeah. Because yeah, be really like uh, the, the Texas folks, they are claiming that uh, we need to share more the core, the, not the kernel CI like testing the trees, but uh, the what, what, how to connect to the labs and how to send it as jobs. That's something that uh, really Zephyr cool. and, and and Linux yeah. and. Yeah. presentation before lunch, so if everyone can have a seat or take it to the hallway. Start. Okay. Hello, everyone. My name is uh, Luigi Pellecchia. I'm a principal software quality engineer at Red Hat. And uh, today, uh, this talk is about uh, the application of uh, an open source tool for traceability applied to LTP tests uh, that we 
uh, used for Cisco's. And now we can map those tests uh, against MumPage for functional testing. We will see how community can be notified to changes to any piece of this uh, traceability matrix. And now this tool provides some other additional benefits that we can uh, really, le really leverage during our uh, daily work. So before starting through words around this tool, this is an open source tool for quality management. That is uh, the development is uh, mainly driven by the ELISA project. ELISA is, is the acronym of uh, Enabling Linux in Safety Application. It's a project of uh, Linux Foundation. This is a web application um, that uh, can be deployed with the uh, Docker containers. It supports uh, user management, and uh, its main purpose is to establish traceability between work items such as software requirements, test specification, test cases, uh, test results, bugs, and uh, source code, and more. So it comes also with a test execution framework that is a, have an abstraction layer that allows users to run any kind of test suite against a different type of a target system. So let's have a look to the use case that is about a Linux test project. So the first approach to uh, any project like this is uh, going into the documentation as usual. So Linux test project is uh, uh, suggesting in the documentation to try to find an untested Cisco that has a AMAN page and uh, ask you to uh, try to, to find some untested parameters or errors code. So the, the problem I see around that, that is uh, explained on the image on the left, is that people not uh, reading a page have to do their analysis and anyone is doing the, their own analysis all the times and their findings are uh, immediately lost because we are not reusing any findings. You know? So someone can spot a, a gap and um, probably can contribute to the project but at the end the new one, the new contributor the day after have to do the same analysis again. So the goal here is to reduce, the, to simplify the onboarding to any project and that can be can be done clarifying the gaps. No, if it's clear the gaps when you join a project, you can start contributing at the day zero. So we can try to reach this goal using uh, uh, this traceability tool uh, in the middle of the user and uh, the source specification, the software specification. So basically, that is uh, this tool that we are talking today. Can be, uh, can be part of this, can stay in the middle of this, uh, so a user can, instead of uh, reaching the man page, can reach Basil, that interacts with the man page, and Basil will provide to the user a simplified view that highlights the gaps. So you, instead of reading the man page, you access this tool and you really have the picture of what is the current gap. Any findings can be reused because user can add uh, a new test traced against uh, the specification and anyone can reuse those findings you know, and we are going to you know, step by step reduce the gaps and try to reach the, the test coverage or anyway the, um, let's say, the work items coverage that we want because this tool also work with requirements so we can create requirements against specification and so on, we will see later. So the goal is to uh, simplify the onboarding and we hope that that approach can uh, really uh, drive community to increment the contribution. So uh, this is how the tools looks like. So uh, this is the user interface. You can see in the main section we have, uh, I don't know if it's uh, visible, I hope, uh, the, the white section is divided in two sections. On the left side, you have the reference document that can be uh, the software specification, can be source code, can be any manual or whatever, safety manual or whatever. And uh, uh, on the right side, for each section, you can specify work items. So in this view, you, are, you can see some uh, section that has been mapped against the test cases and, for example, the, the gray section doesn't have any, any work item related to it, so it's like reaching this page, you know, it's clear that for that section, for that particular functionality, 
we don't have any tests, so anyone can join this page and uh, start creating a test for that functionality. There is also another uh, uh, way to uh, spot gaps and is using a percentage of coverage. It's probably the name is not the best one because now we are talking a lot about code coverage, but is not intended to be code coverage because we can also have on the right side uh, work um, software requirements, for example, or test specification or whatever. This percentage is aimed to say to our community that if that work item is enough itself to cover the specification or we need to uh, create other work items, so it's a, an indication that we have some gaps. So we can uh, um, reduce our investigation just to have uh, a reading to a, a small section of the documentation. So uh, before going into the analysis that I did for the syscalls, uh, let me add other two words around the tool. This is, this is aimed to be a collaborative tool. So uh, this tool provides to the user different view. You can focus on uh, the work item that you want. So the, the idea is to try to work in parallel software engineer and quality engineer. So a software engineer can write the test specification for a functionality saying, uh, to test this functionality, you need to perform this maneuver, and that is the expected behavior. So, and in parallel, a test engineer can start implementing the test code provided by uh, the software engineer. That is not the, the best scenario, no. But um, other collaborative uh, uh, feature are comments. You can start a discussion around the test, uh, work items, uh, and. It also supports uh, work item life cycle. So you can have uh, uh, a work item no, in progress. You can ask for review. Uh, someone can approve your work item, can reject it. You can rework it and stuff like that. Another thing is that you can enable notification at software component level. So if you enable notification, anything that happens around your software component, you will be notified. So if someone adds a new test case, if someone runs a test, uh, test uh, you will be notified about the test result and uh, stuff like that. Also, if new users join your instance online. So uh, that is the analysis uh, that I did with the Linux syscalls. So starting from the man page project, I listed all the syscalls under the man2 uh, folder. And from that, uh, at that moment, I have the software component, the syscall, and the man page, the software specification. So I was able to create a, a software component into this, uh, this tool. After that, I uh, add a read to all the man page with an automation. So as the man page are written in a way that we can uh, extract simply sections, and inside section we can uh, find a way to extract uh, arguments, uh, uh, options, and uh, different type of errors. Uh, I extracted all those information, and uh, uh, for, for each one I verified if we already have uh, an LTP uh, test case for that syscall that, that uses that pa uh, particular option for that uh, syscall. And if yes, I created a, a test case uh, work item in the tool that has been mapped against the relative section of the um, specification. Not only that, also I had a, a screening of the source code so uh, to identify the implementation file uh, and the section where the uh, syscall has been implemented. So this way, uh, as an exercise, I've created a, a document work item that has been mapped against uh, the synopsis section of the man page. So that way you can easily check that the synopsis really match you know, the implementation. So that we have the same argument, the same expected return value, and so stuff like that. So um, this analysis is publicly available under the Analisa web server, available at this URL. We uh, will navigate it a bit. Um, so the idea is that this is publicly available. You can join this tool, create your account, you can contribute on the create the uh, to refine the automated traceability. Anyone can benefit from that. But you can also start uh, another uh, library, I don't know, for a, a kernel subsystem, 
creating you know, software components so all the API of your subsystem can be uh, analyzed. Uh, Elisa will be happy to onboard any other library. So let's try to navigate this website. Okay. This is the, um, the public instance of ELISA. So you see we are in the Cisco library where we have uh, around 300 uh, Cisco's. And so let's have a look to uh, an API that has been analyzed with, uh, uh, with the automation. So, okay, now the mouse is working that way. So you can uh, uh, select a different view in the tool. Uh, now we are focusing on test cases, but you can focus on different work items just to see, for example, you can just for, uh, have a look to the man page because the, the mapping split the man page so uh, you can easily uh, read it in a compacted view. So let's have a look to the test case view. Okay. So uh, you can see that the first element that has, that has been mapped is a, a justification. It is our kind aimed to provide the completeness of analysis. So we want that all the specification have a, a related work item, a work item. So at least we can state to an assessor or to um, anyone that we analyze the full specification. And that uh, is just an example. So let's go to uh, the synopsis. So that is uh, the uh, document work item. So where you can see uh, this is the file of the implementation. This is the section of the file that implement the, the syscall. And uh, you can see that uh, uh, this tool automatically validates those links. So at the moment, this link is broken because this file changed by the time that I created the mapping. But the tool can help you to automatically fix uh, uh, some, some kind of changes. Um, and um, let's scroll a bit down to section that has been mapped automatically. So for example, here, for some errors, I was able to identify the test case um, that cover this section. And so you can see that way that we have some untested uh, um, error type, at least for this API. Uh, let's try to have a look now to an API that I analyzed with a bit more detail after um, this uh, initial automated effort. So uh, as, as you can see, the synopsis has been mapped against the syscall. I added another detail because at the end, this syscall just call another function. So I uh, added the, mm, the other function because that way you know, anyone can have a clear idea more or less of what this API is doing. Uh, then another piece of the synopsis, uh, uh, in, re in reality, talk about a different API. So you can, I added a justification to say this is not part of our uh, analysis today because it's a different syscall. And then um, I uh, analyzed the section by section all the uh, all the section of the of the specification. So here you can see I added some more details. No, um, collecting the data that we have available uh, in a Linux test project uh, into the, co the either comment. Um, so, um, another uh, thing that I want to share to you, uh, let's just scroll the, the full document so you can see that there are sections with, with gaps. Okay, so uh, another thing I want to share to you is that uh, uh, this tool provides a test execution framework uh, that use uh, an abstraction layer because the idea is to be able to run any kind of test suite written in any language. So the solution was to introduce this uh, abstraction layer that is a Python module provided by um, Red Hat, so it's a Red Hat project named the TMT, the acronym of Test Management Tool. 
And this tool also provides uh, a provisioning system, so you can, uh, uh, there are several provisioning uh, systems that you can uh, use. This tool is uh, basically, uh, at the moment, is supporting a Fedora container and uh, connect via SSH. So if you have your own device uh, or uh, you can connect via SSH. So let's look at an example. From, from the three dots uh, menu, you can reach all the uh, options. So for example, I already executed this test. So you can see uh, here I have the test result and uh, I can navigate information about this test. Like for example, the log, the log test, uh, where you can see that this, uh, this test have some, uh, some requirements in terms of uh, uh, dependencies. So it's installing additional packages and uh, at the end of the logs you can see uh, the result. So uh, here, for example, no? uh, it performed uh, several uh, verification and we have uh, that all the tests passed. So you can also reach artifacts because uh, uh, this tool provides uh, uh, some environment variable that you can leverage. Uh, and if you move your, uh, your artifacts in a particular folder, you can access it from the user interface itself. You can also uh, link bugs in this tool because this tool is aimed to create a traceability matrix. So we want to, to know if uh, for a failure we already have a bugs or, uh, or not. And you can rerun it, you can delete your test run and stuff like that. Okay, so let's back to, uh, to the slide. Okay, that is just a reminder to me to show about the test execution framework. Yeah, two words around for, uh, software evolution, because we know now that uh, <laughs> this, uh, software is something that can uh, really change uh, quickly, and that's most true for upstream projects like you know, the, uh, the Linux kernel. So uh, this tool provides a few, uh, few ways to follow the software evolution. So essentially, if your uh, reference document uh, change, you will see that the mapping never exists, and that will be listed at the end of the file. So you have to refine this mapping no? manually. Or we can leverage some automation by the tool if the mapping uh, still exists in the document, but is just shifted, because Basil um, is handling uh, uh, the mapping with offset and the content. So the, it can help to, to, to really fix, automatically fix some kind of, uh, of uh, broken links. The other way is that uh, the one that I showed before for document, the text plain, uh, plain text document, you can, uh, uh, the link is validated at any time that you open the, the mapping, so you are, will be notified if uh, the, the document changed. So, for example, the source code changed, so that can be a trigger for you to have a check to the specification. Th there are, from my point of view, two possible approaches to the software evolution. You can uh, uh, fix the version of the software specification. Uh, that is mostly true for projects like uh, we have in automotive or other fields uh, like this, because now we know that we want to uh, have on the road a particular version of the software and changes are no, not so frequent. And uh, in that case, your mapping will be more stable. So the mapping will be affected only from the right side of the things, so only from your work items. So in that case, you don't have to implement any CI CD in the, in the software specification repository. Uh, but the problem is that your uh, analysis doesn't reflect the state of the art of the, of the software. No? Uh, the other solution is that you can follow the head of the repository. And in that case, the mapping is going to change uh, quite soon. And in that case, is probably the best solution is to have a CI CD in place that can help you to automatically fix stuff and uh, to uh, at least follow those, those changes better. So 
uh, depends on the project, but probably we can also, no, uh, are not alternative. You can apply both, uh, both approach. You can have in the same library a reference to a particular version of the software component or in, in another uh, instance of that software component that fall of the, the head of the repository. Let's talk a bit about uh, the possibility to integrate this tool in CI/CD. This tool uh, comes with an HTTP API. So essentially, you see here the architecture of the tool is a, there is a front end that interacts with uh, the, H, the, the HTTP API. That is the only part of the tool that interacts with the database. So user can interact with the user interface, but can also the, interact directly with the HTTP API. And any action that you can perform on the user interface can be done uh, via HTTP API. So you can run your test, for example, check for results, and then, uh, I don't know, integrate the test execution in your CI, for example. So those are a few examples of automation. So uh, to follow the man, the man page, for example, as a specification, um, the changes in the man page, we need to have this project in a repository that allows CICD, or at least we need to have a CICD repository that at least nightly run to verify changes to this, um, to this project. And then from that, we can uh, notify people about uh, uh, changes, and we can automatically fix warnings. And there is another uh, idea to simplify the, uh, no, the, um, the mapping, so to keep the mapping updated, starting from the, test, the Linux test project, so we can think on adding some uh, metadata into uh, each test, with the mapping information, we can reuse that mapping information in CI and keep the traceability updated in our basic instance. Uh, that's all from my side. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to, to ask one. Any questions at all? Okay. Thank you. Thank you.